Okay, so um, so Mari's given me the uh, the get go. So we have uh, I've been really interested to see all the directions that people are taking NTA in, and uh, uh, so far we've seen some really interesting things. And I hope uh, the presenters today uh, won't disappoint us. I'm sure they won't. Um, we're talking in this session about distributional accounts. Um, and our first paper is called Distributional Aspects of Aging in America, Insights from National Transfer Accounts and by Ron, Gretchen, Andy, and Michael Abrigo. So, uh, Ron. So, um, these, the estimates for this talk just came in yesterday, uh, latest in the afternoon. So what I'm trying to show is early uh, results, uh, not entirely digested, but I think there are some very interesting things here. And the estimates are uh, thanks mostly to Gretchen with some earlier contribution from Michael. And um, what we have is uh, socioeconomic differences by education and education quintile and compared over time from 1988 to 2018. And I will also be showing uh, some results from the main workshop on distributional NTA, micro NTA. And these estimates um, now include college students and prison inmates and people in nursing homes, the institutionalized population. And that was a ton of work and it's great to have it now. So I'll start with 2006 to 2018 and then move on to new results. So this is a measure of inequality in labor income. It's the interquartile range divided by the median and the median of those ratios And we see that uh, it's roughly equal, uh, that is flat prior to the Great Recession, and then it rises strongly during the recession years, and then it declines slowly, and by 2018, it's not yet uh, fallen as low as it was at the beginning. Here we have ratio of labor income for workers with a college degree to those with less than high flat before the Great Recession. Then you see it rises quite uh, dramatically at the start of the recession, and then eventually declines as unemployment falls lower and lower in the U.S. to well below 4%, and it ends up lower than it started. And then here is the ratio of male to female. Labor. I'm going to move on now to the new results. Um, and here we have the new results on labor income by sex. Um, and you can see that it the differences have contracted from 1988 on the top panel to 2018 on the bottom. And then on the left here, you look at these bars. This is an inequality measure uh, showing a similar decline. This is the uh, male earnings minus female earnings divided by the median at each age, and it's the median across those ratios. And so you see it declines significantly. Okay. And here we have consumption by education quintile. Um, and over time, the share of the population with low education shrinks and the share with high education grows. So there are serious selectivity issues in comparison, comparing these measures of inequality uh, across time. And so in addition to doing this by educational attainment, which is done in these, this left column, we also do it by educational quintile. So for example, the bottom 20% of educational attained is the lowest quintile. And that's shown on the right panel. And uh, that deals with, uh, at least partially, with this, these selectivity problems. You can see that it's always the case that 
uh, when you go to the quintile measures, the measures of inequality show less dispersion. That's true in 1988, it's true in 2018. And we can also see that uh, over time, there was an increase in inequality by both measures. And we see the same thing when we look at these uh, inequality measure bars on the left. Inequality increased uh, by both measures, and you can see that general inequality is lower by the quintile measure than by the absolute measure. Labor income by education is uh, also interesting to look at. We can see that uh, inequality increased uh, by the quintile measure, it also increased by a little bit less. And we see the same thing when we look at these summary uh, measures. In fact, there's quite a dramatic reduction when we look at the quintile uh, measures compared to the absolute measure. Here we have government transfers received by education and by education quintile. Uh, and you can see that there's not much uh, inequality by either measure. It is a little bit less by the quintile measure. I'm not showing the bars here. But there's an interesting point to notice here, which is that this thin blue line, which is the lowest uh, education group and the lowest educational quintile group, uh, it actually has increased government transfers uh, in 2018 relative to 1988. I would have uh, expected that the opposite had happened, that our public sort of welfare, public assistance programs had become less generous. I would have been wrong. And also there's a similar pattern for public education, uh, which may reflect higher education groups sending their kids to private school. I'm not sure it's to be exploited. Uh, okay. Here we have taxes by education and by education quintile. Uh, here was perhaps my biggest surprise because you see that uh, the tax payment equality has greatly increased. Well, this is a change in the good direction. You see the highest quintiles paying higher taxes relative to labor income and the lowest quintiles paying lower taxes. And you see this by uh, both kinds of measures. And if you look on the left here, you will see that it's really quite a dramatic change, uh, up by a factor of, of five. No, yes, no, a factor of two and a half uh, by both uh, measures. So I had thought the opposite had happened, that our taxation system had become less progressive. Of course, we're not seeing the base incomes that are being taxed here. But still, just on the tax payments, I would have uh, not expected this result. So that's very interesting to me. Now here's asset income by education, education and income quantile. And you see that asset income has become, uh, well, it's not so obvious just looking at us because the scale has changed and the eye has difficulty perceiving it. But if you look over here, you can see uh, at, at the inequality measure, you can see that the inequality has increased in asset income because this is all relative to the uh, level of, of asset income. And you say this, see the same thing by quantiles. It's also interesting to note that the lower uh, education uh, one minute run. of asset income in both periods, and the same thing is true with our quintile measures, maybe even more strongly uh, in 1988 with the quintile measure. Okay, now we heard a wonderful presentation by Tim and Nicole, and they, uh, their method requires that we assume the shape of the age profiles of various things are the same for the top 10% and the bottom 9% of the income. Well, we can't test this exactly, but we can explore it. <clears throat> so here we're looking at private asset income in 2018, um, down here. And uh, I've restricted it for to ages 50 to 85 because we're looking at a log scale here. Because in the log scale, if the, the profiles...
that means the age shapes are the same. And, and below age 50, because you have negative values, I can't use the log transform. So um, we see that for 2018, the assumption of the same shape is remarkably good, I would say. Surprisingly good. I wouldn't have expected this. For, 2000, for 1988, though, it's not really so good. You see that uh, there's a lot of convergence in the lowest uh, education group. Okay, uh, so in the future, we'll try to do something more exact. We'll, look, we'll have income distribution measures. We can compare the 10% top and the lower 90%. That's for the future. Uh, finally, then, um, we hope in the future, so this is looking at uh, inequality defined by SES. In the future, we hope to actually look at the ind distributions across individuals and compare those distributions uh, for primary income and then to post transfer income. The same thing for wealth and compare our results to peak of these sciences. So come on, taking into account transfer wealth and other, I think, very interesting things, but this is what we've got right now. Thank you very much and sorry for all those problems. Okay, thank you, Ron. Um, so we'll now move to the, the next presentation, which is uh, by Emma, Tanya, and Yaja. And I think um, Emma is going to be presenting. Okay, as David already said, uh, this is the work on future total income and consumption levels according to educational level in EU countries, a work in progress together with uh, Tanya and Yaja from uh, Slovenian NTA. Uh, my name is Emma and this is my first time presenting on a conference slash meeting, so uh, please excuse me if I make uh, any mistakes. Um, okay, so uh, to start with the motivation, uh, basically we uh, wanted to check um, how economic growth depends uh, on age and educational level. So basically besides depending on age, it also depends on uh, other demographic uh, dimensions, educational level of individuals being uh, one of them. And uh, we started uh, from two points. Um, one of them is more uh, that more educated earn high la higher labor income, but they also consume more, which I will also show in a minute. And that, that the level of educational attainment is project uh, projected to increase uh, in the future, which I will also show. And there we had two questions that we decided to ask ourselves. So uh, one of them is how would future uh, higher educational attainment improve economic uh, sustainability in EU countries given the current pattern of labor income and consumption, and also can increased level of educational attain, uh, attainment mitigate the consequences of population aging in terms of economic uh, sustainability. Uh, so this, this was one of the, one of the first uh, points that we uh, started from. So we um, looked at the Eurostat data for uh, 15 Euro country, uh, European countries that we will um, do the research on. And basically what we, uh, what we saw is that the, um, uh, the earnings, gross earnings uh, for uh, primary and the secondary levels that are shown with the um, orange and the red lines are, uh, so the difference is quite small, but when you look at the uh, blue and the green lines that represent the tertiary education, the gross earnings are um, quite higher. Uh, this is very important because uh, when we look uh, looked at the projected share of individuals um, by 2060, we can see that uh, the post-secondary educational levels um, that are contain, uh, contained uh, by tertiary education um, uh, mostly, they will uh, increase by um, around 17%. So they're projected to increase um, around 17%, uh, making that um, higher income um, they will actually uh, more pronounce it. Um, okay, so this is the methodology at, and uh, data that we use. So we focused on 15 EU, EU countries that we had the NTA data for uh, 2010 deco decomposed by three educational levels uh, available. And then we uh, combined those data with the uh, Wittgenstein Center population projections that are also uh, decomposed by three educational levels. Now I have to um, state the difference between uh, these two data sets because uh, the NTA data for 2010 
uh, follows the ISCD uh, 1997 um, groups of education. So uh, this is the UNESCO's um, international standard classification of education. And in the 1997 version, it had uh, six education groups. And then um, in, nine, uh, in 2011, uh, they introduced a new classi uh, classification containing of uh, eight educational groups that uh, Wittgenstein Center uh, follows. Uh, but basically, the most of the most of the changes are in the tertiary part. So these um, uh, these categories five and six were divided uh, in two more categories. So they are now from five to eight, not just uh, five and uh, six. Um, okay. Uh, so um, uh, another thing that I have to point out that is that NTA data has um, the secondary uh, education category. It's called higher education uh, category. It has two uh, categories, IECD uh, three and four, whereas Wittgenstein Center uh, has the category four uh, together with the category five, making it post secondary and not secondary um, education. So um, we assumed here that all the post secondary uh, education um, apply the labor income uh, and uh, consumption from the from the tertiary. Uh, education group from uh, NTA data. Um, okay, uh, so uh, these are the labor income and consumption um, levels uh, for EU15 by age and educational level for uh, 2010. So this was our uh, starting point. Uh, on the left hand side, you can see the conventional uh, NTA per capita. Um, so labor income and uh, consumption. And then on the right hand side, uh, the black line is also average labor income and average consumption. Uh, whereas the green lines, uh, they represent the uh, consumption and labor income for the primary education, then orange lines secondary education, and then uh, the blue lines uh, post-secondary education. And you can see that um, in, the, uh, in the right hand side, uh, the labor income is a bit skewed to the right, uh, which is because of the tertiary education that follows the same pattern. Um, so this is uh, how we uh, projected uh, the total labor income and consumption for Estonia and Italy. These are just uh, the examples, uh, basically because Estonia showed the smallest differences and Italy was one of the countries that, show, that showed uh, most of the differences. For Estonia, you can see that uh, all the income and uh, consumption lines were uh, a bit more smoothed, uh, whereas um, uh, in 2016, when we compare it to uh, 2020. And for Italy, uh, you can see a big change in total income because um, in, in 2020, the most of the income was, um, uh, was coming from the secondary education whereas in 2060, it is expected that most of the income will, uh, will come from the, uh, from the post-secondary uh, education. Okay, uh, so here we have uh, the increase and decrease of total labor income and consumption for these EU15 countries in 2060 relative to 2020. What is important to see in this picture is that when we look at the conventional NTA, we can see that most of the countries uh, show the drop in labor income for more than 20% uh, in 2060 compared to 2020. Whereas when we do the NTA by education, most of the countries don't, uh, don't cross over 20%. They even stay below uh, 15 for the most part. Okay, uh, so most of the results are uh, here in this table. Uh, so we made uh, ratios of, uh, first of all, in the first column of uh, conventional eight NTA in terms of labor income and consumption when comparing 2060 to uh, 2020. And then we repeated the same uh, for the NTA by education. And then in the third, uh, in the third column, we compared uh, the labor income by education and uh, labor income by conventional NTA. And we repeated the same for the consumption. And then you can see that um, if you compare the labor, labor income by education, um, and labor income by uh, conventional NTA methods, basically the labor income by education will be higher by almost 20, uh, 21%, and uh, consumption will be higher for uh, almost 9%. 
And then um, in this uh, gray and red area, we uh, calculated the dependency ratios for, 2000 and, uh, uh, for 2020 and 2060, both for conventional NTA and NTA by education, where again, if you look the, uh, if you look the last line where we have the average uh, ratios, we can see that the ratio uh, of NTA by education is smaller at the beginning, and it will also uh, show a smaller increase, which is positive because uh, that means that um, more consumption is supported by the by the lab labor income. So it is our goal to have this uh, this ratio smaller. Okay, I will. I think I am close to the time limit, so I will uh, skip this slide. You've got and, one or two uh, minutes. Sorry. You've got one or two minutes. Okay, perfect. Uh, so we have these projections of average, average labor income and consumption uh, by 2060, and it's shown in billion of euros. So the full lines uh, represent labor income. Um, orange one is the uh, conventional NTA, and the uh, black line is um, the NTA by education, and the dotted lines are uh, consumption uh, consumptions. And we can see that the gap between the um, black lines is a bit smaller than it is um, uh, between the orange lines, which means that basically if we take the educational level uh, into account, we can see that um, the gap between consumption and uh, labor income uh, will be smaller than if we just look at the uh, age decomposition. And finally, uh, if we look at the uh, economic dependency ratio, uh, which we uh, calculated as consumption over uh, labor income, and we use it as uh, an in indicator for economic sustainability, we can see that this indicator um, will be much smaller for the uh, NTA by education than it is uh, for the conventional NTA, meaning that more uh, consumption should be covered by the, by the labor income. And again, this is positive because we want for this uh, ratio to be um, as close, uh, as smaller as uh, possible. Okay, and uh, just uh, just the final um, limitations and conclusions, the final slide. So limitations are that we have the cross-sectional data for uh, 2010, and we assume that distribution of labor income and consumption mm -hmm. by age and educational, uh, ed educational level will remain unchanged until 2060. And then there is also uh, the problem with the ISCD. Uh, ICD is not uh, completely uh, being the same uh, within the two data sets. And this is something that we are still working on. And the conclusions um, are the following. If we take into account the future improvement in educational attainment, we should see a positive impact on labor income by 2060. So it should be around 20% on average. Again, also the increased consumption uh, around the 9% on average, but still the net effect is positive. Uh, so the uh, labor income will increase more than the consumption, which will result in a smaller gap between the labor income and consumption in the future, which is um, basically a very positive result for the uh, economic uh, sustainability. Okay, and this is it uh, from me, and I'm looking forward to your comments. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Emma. Now we turn to um, Robert Gall, uh, Martin and Peter. I'm not going to try and pronounce those names. And uh, they're going to tell us uh, what the welfare states, what welfare states really do. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Robert Gass speaking on a pre-recorded presentation. Uh, this paper is a collaboration between myself, Martin uh, Medjeshi uh, from Budapest, and Peter van Huysa uh, from Odense, Denmark. Uh, we well uh, our, our motivation our point of departure uh, is the observation that the welfare state is most frequently by its effectiveness and efficiency in uh, poverty alleviation and inequality uh, mitigation there is a large body of literature uh, that uh, repeatedly finds um, uh, poor targeting of the benefits or uh, even methu effects when uh, uh, those who have received and those who don't have are taken away from. Uh, the, the tone is uh, uh, highly critical. 
uh, or sometimes just lamenting uh, the dysfunctional uh, way of working of the welfare state. However, uh, for an NTA audience, it's, uh, it's not surprising uh, that the various headings of welfare spending have clear age profiles. So uh, beneficiaries are typically in, in active age, contributors are typically of working age. From uh, the point of view of NTA analysis, the welfare state seems to be an inter-age project. So our research is to, to, to figure it out, to, uh, to decide whether uh, the welfare state in Europe uh, is more an inter-age or more an inter-SES uh, status group um, uh, type of reallocation mechanism. Uh, we compare the relative importance of these two explanatory variables in explaining the access to benefits uh, and in separate models, uh, uh, the contribution to the funding of uh, these benefits and in a combined model, uh, the, uh, that of the net benefit. Uh, here is a three-dimensional uh, distribution of uh, uh, welfare spending per capita. Uh, in the European Union, um, the figures are a simple average of 22 member states out, out of the 27 member states in 2010. And um, the figure uh, represents a bit over 70% uh, uh, of the population of the EU. Um, the horizontal axes are age and uh, status groups. Uh, for better visibility, the image is rotated, so you, you find the, the youngest on the right uh, and the oldest age group on the left. Uh, age groups consist of uh, the same number of people, so um, the age brackets uh, uh, are not uh, ex uh, of exact uh, same length uh, because of the, uh, of the age composition of the EU population. Uh, in, on the figure, um, uh, I show you five um, uh, different status groups uh, from highest, they are uh, the closest to you, and the lowest uh, or the poorest are uh, in the rear. Uh, in the analysis, um, uh, we use uh, the same number of um, <clears throat> status groups uh, as many uh, age groups we have, and uh, the same way we cut uh, the population to 10, uh, 10 D size in, in this respect. You can see, uh, well, at least uh, for the eyeball analysis, the welfare state in Europe seems to be uh, an inter-age uh, project. So it is children who receive, and especially the elderly. Here, it, uh, you see um, that uh, uh, surface from below, I will rotate it so you will see it better. You can uh, also find that there is a bit of um, uh, income or status effect in that uh, the poorest um, um, working age group receive a bit more than uh, the richest, and it just turns around. In old age, it is the highest uh, status group uh, that receives the most. Um, so there is an income effect, or not just one, but uh, two opposite effects. There, there, there is an interaction between status and age, um, but uh, it doesn't seem to be that strong compared to the uh, true age effect. So it, it looks like a riverbed, and I will just fly uh, my drone. Look, and now you can see that there is there is a bit of Brazilian uh, a taste of uh, the European welfare state too, uh, so that uh, the, the most favored group is uh, <clears throat> the highest um, uh, status group in old age. Um, you can see uh, the other uh, income effect or status effect uh, of the opposite direction uh, in working age. Uh, I have the same figures for uh, the taxation side of the welfare state. So uh, 
uh, the age and status composition uh, of those who finance the welfare state and uh, one uh, for the net effects, but uh, it's in the presentation and it will be in the paper, but I don't have time to show that for you now. So um, uh, when we test the, uh, well, we, we just want to measure what we uh, what we saw. We, we want to test uh, and complete the eyeball analysis, um, uh, and we we use two very obvious type of measures. Um, uh, we want to compare the relative importance of the two explanatory variables, age versus status, uh, and uh, there are two ways to do that. Uh, one is uh, to compare the coefficients, the regression coefficients uh, of the two variables, and the other one is to measure um, the, uh, their, their uh, individual com uh, contribution uh, to the explanation of the total variation. So one by uh, uh, variation and one by coefficients, the um, uh, uh, coefficient-based analysis uh, is called by the literature, the measurement of the causal importance and the other um, uh, is uh, the dispersion uh, importance. We use the simplest uh, uh, possible uh, uh, OLS regression model. Uh, two groups of variables, two vectors of variables, um, um, nine age groups and nine status groups, and the reference is always the, the, the smallest. So um, uh, in age, the youngest, and in status, uh, uh, the, the group of people with the, uh, with the lowest social socioeconomic status. Uh, and this is what we find um, um, uh, well, this, this is what uh, you, you usually read in a paper as a table with the, with the betas, uh, the p's, and the t values. Um, uh, here, um, just for easier consumption, uh, I instead uh, uh, drew a chart of, um, uh, of the coefficients, uh, respectively, uh, for age and for uh, socioeconomic status. Uh, and yeah, although we we uh, uh, calculated the uh, really the simplest and most obvious uh, uh, indicators, but you can see it uh, with uh, with the naked eyes that uh, uh, in the coefficient analysis, um, age uh, is, uh, appears to be much more important than socioeconomic status. Again, we have the same. Um, analysis for taxes and for net benefits, but I will jump them and go directly uh, to the table of the other uh, dispersion importance analysis. Here you, you, you find the three models together, but I uh, limit myself to benefits. And uh, we have in, in all three models, we have two versions, one, one which uh, uh, includes uh, an interaction term for um, status and age, and another one which does not. Um, we in the robustness test we uh, we have calculations including other uh, control variables, but they in fact they don't add too much uh, to the model. And uh, well, our base model is the one with interaction, uh, which explains about thirty percent of the total variation. Uh, and you can see that this 30% is uh, almost exclusively 92% um, uh, is, uh, can be attributed to age uh, and only just a small uh, fraction to status. So um, uh, we confirmed that uh, the welfare programs are insensitive to status differences. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, and this is what uh, uh, I think uh, uh, contribution to literature that age uh, has a sizable effect uh, on, on the access to the welfare system, also uh, to, um, to the uh, contributions to its funding. Uh, so the European social policy 
overall is better described as an inter-age transfer system uh, rather than uh, a public program alleviating poverty or uh, mitigating inequality. So uh, social policies should primarily uh, be tested uh, by their targeting across age rather than uh, 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 status, uh, so rather than uh, uh, their ability to alleviate poverty or um, uh, uh, mitigate um, inequalities. It doesn't say uh, definitely, strongly and emphatically, doesn't say that uh, uh, the welfare state should, should not care about uh, these kind of these functions, poverty and inequality, and it certainly doesn't say definitely it doesn't say that uh, um, uh, mitigating inequalities uh, uh, would be irrelevant. Uh, uh, to the contrary, uh, we would say that all forms of government intervention and not just the welfare state should be taken at task. Uh, when it comes to poverty and inequality. There are many ways uh, to mitigate poverty uh, or inequalities or uh, decrease inequalities. And we just don't find the reason why social policy, the welfare state is singled out uh, as an inter-age project uh, and uh, do uh, uh, the, the most of this job or um, um, uh, sometimes even uh, uh, do the job by itself alone. Okay, so thank you, thank you very much, Robert. Um, we now turn to the last presentation, um, and that is by uh, a group of people, um, and it's called Micro Wealth uh, Distribution Effect Along the Life Cycle. Hi, everyone. Uh, as he said, is a John Sean people from NTA, Gemma, Tania, Lupe, and some other co-author of a project. Uh, I will explain first um, the, the, the micro simulation model we are building, and then I will go backwards to explain the NTA by family type and education level, which are basically an input in the model. The model, okay. Explain that because I think it's more interesting for the audience. And then just a bit of next steps. We're, this is completely a work in progress and very fresh results. So, this is the project, it's called Well Transit Project, studying a micro simulation model called Micro Wealth. And basically, the motivation is to school pace for longer lives, uh, have a look at the welfare, we have four countries representative of these welfare regimes. And see the effects of our lives. The session is this one, finished, and the other four partners, which are ATA, Finland, and Barcelona, Spain, sorry. And then the WIFO Institute, who are, who are um, specialists in, micro, in dynamic micro simulation. So, uh, the technical design of the, of the model is is written in this modgen programming language, which is very efficient, is very highly modular, self-documented in the website. Actually, it's all in the website. You can have a look at the, even to the programming um, code. And it builds an NTA and other existing tools. We start basically from Euromod, which is a static tax benefit micro simulation model. And we, Try to dynamize it in in a in a stylized way. I will explain that. So the, the we have a micro simulation model first, and then the NTA part. This is we have detailed uh, sociodemographic projection at micro level uh, for for family histories. We look at fertility by education, looking at the childlessness, uh, first childlessness, and then first and second child. Then we also look at partnerships. We have school enrollment and also international transmission of education. This is all in seal. Okay? And then we also introduce more quality by education level. I will show you later some results. And then this is the, like the NTA part for, for the moment in aggregate. We have um, longitudinal cross-section NTA by family type and education and use it 
coming as a parameters to, to, to have richer projection. Basically, at the moment, what we are doing is to improve macro projections to have education and family type inside the effect of that. And of course, the, the main focus, I didn't put it here, but the main objective of the, of the model was having like the NTA by family in longitudinal, longitudinal project. This is a bit of the of the modern this this micro simulation dynamic micro simulation model. Our partner, this wife partner from Austria, they are specialized on that. They have like different models of different things, and we are they are building like a, an open source platform to to to, to be found to use that. Um, we we'll, we'll go now to the um, to the. A bit more details on the structure. Education, we have three levels. We have these family groups, children, and then students, students who are, or, are taken from the school from the moment. Adults, and basically partnership not, children or not, and then single, single parents also, and then adults 60 plus, the same division. Uh, for this NTA part, we have we are using basically the, I, I think I, I showed it before, but anyway, two papers by Ron and Andy and other authors that are doing this uh, support ratio and impact index on the one hand, for well, this is uh, Ron and Andy paper, and then also full generational accounts, we reproduce it in the model. I'll show you some results. And also, of course, we need this adjustment or not adjust taxes and benefits. Also, the open and closed economy. This is from the from this one paper. I'll just show you the results just to have the flow, and then I will I will focus on the NTAs. So this we obtain these super ratios uh, in two ways. First, the aggregated so meaning that the parameters to to, to see the final the parameters of the projections are only aggregate NTA, we compute the ratio, the index, and then we do, we use this, this NTA education and family type, and we see that there are sizable differences in the projections. Okay, this is the, sorry, I need to put that more. Okay, yes. Then another outcome we are looking at is full is this international accounts who compute. This is just shown by education level. We have this um, here's an adjusted meaning that we just project the profiles. Then uh, you can see that disaggregating disaggregating seems to have no much. This is the the net present of life, lifetime public transfers as proportion of lifetime income. This is aggregated NTA. So this is the value of the newborn in 2011. When you disaggregate, you see, it seems that it has no much effect, but when you see by education level, you see sizable differences. The yellow one is adjust, <coughs> adjusting to budget, adjusting the budget, so adjusting tax and to, to meet the budget. Then you see that it becomes negative. And, also, and then disaggregating, and this, sorry, this is the 2011 cohort. This is the 2040, the, the blue one. I don't see my. And, and then um, the segregating that the effects really differ by education level. And then another just piece of results I'll show you is when, you, when we take into account this, uh, these differences of mortalization, the red one is just. Without mortality differences, this is the net present value, the same thing by education level for different courts, born here in 2011 and the, board, the one born later. No? And this is when you take into account the mortality differences, you see that the low education and medium education are, are really affected because of the shorter life they have. Sorry, this is a bit quick. I can do it. Minute. So now I will, I will just show some results. This NTA by education and family type, as I said, is like an, a parameter of the model. Uh, first, we had uh, we know that when you go micro, you have this problem that the sample is not representative, and you have outliers. So we decided to go to just to simplify by five years age group, and this 
worked quite well. Then we had this, the, the typical problems of smooth, not smoothing. And also because the sub smoothing was not working for 17 years, this is a very silly technical problem that we had, we will solve at some point, but this, then at the end we decided not, because this five years group is doing some smoothing already. So we decided not to smooth in general, only by types. Then we had to decide what to do with parents cohabiting or not. So we decided that the cohabiting guy is the one who is sort of the sixty plus a problem because the sixty plus people you don't observe children there. So we are imputing the childlessness status for sixty plus using share, and it's only for the moment done in Austria. And I will show the results. And then we also had to decide dependent children. For the moment, the dependent children are the ones defined in the survey, which is not real because in Spain, people leave home at 35 so, or something like that. So we have, we also ignore the extended households, but we will look at that outside of the model. This is like the, the immediate plan. So just to the flavor of what we get, this is what we get. This is our Austria, we have 60 plus uh, in the same graph, which is nicer and easier to interpret. We can see all this difference in labor income, in asset income, assumption, assumption, less than one minute. This is what we get. We have some interesting results of redistribution. This is, this, this is also the parents, very important in both cases. Sorry, I'm, I'm, yeah. So, intra household, and finish the next step. Um, in the immediate future, we are going to, to change the household head assumption because we, we have very, um, already when you have NTA by sex, you have a problem with that. So we are going. We are thinking about that. Comments welcome. Welcome here on the way to do it. We are thinking of combining, combining adult being adult and the share of earnings. Then we will um, add NTTA by education and family time. We are already right doing it, and I think it it will be sort of easy just as a parameter. And then the macro model variables. So modeling labor income consumption in order to be able to project it to the future. This is a ambitious and risky project that we want to try and also at, at NTTA and that's it. Okay, Thank thanks, you. Very, thanks very much, Sio. So now um, uh, in this, I'd like to turn to the discussants. So uh, Bernhard is going to uh, commence with his discussion. Discussant in this session because it's nice to see how the NTA dev uh, project develops from calculating age profiles to really integrate all other type of the, uh, demographic or econ uh, socioeconomic characteristics. And I think we could see a little bit the evolution in the, in the presentations because the most straightforward way is of course to calculate age profiles by socioeconomic status like Emma, Danya and Joshe did in their analysis. However, we must be aware that we, when we calculate age profiles by socioeconomic status that the composition of the socioeconomic or, the edu for example, education groups varies a lot across age groups. For example, in uh, age 60, few people had tertiary education, which is in younger age groups up to one third or even up to one half. So in Sonia's analysis, we saw that people despite being better educated, they do not, do not necessarily earn much more than previous generation, which would mean that these age profiles would change in the future and that we should think of better uh, or other methods to project, uh, like for example, life cycle deficit or all these variables for the future. And it was very cool to see uh, Ron's suggestion how to do it. I like the idea very much with the education quintiles because uh, yeah, this can correct a little bit for the, differ uh, for the change in the composition of the di different age groups over time. And also this calculation for several years 
it allows you to really investigate how these age profiles change their shape. Another uh, method to, let's say, improve such simple analysis of holding age profiles a constant is, of course, this micro simulation. I think this is really a very promising way to go. I will work in the future also in a project that will use this approach. And I think especially useful is this for a life course analysis. If you want to uh, uh, simulate the life of people over time, because it's simply using age profiles and interpreting this as a life course of a person uh, is clearly inappropriate. And there's a really, a, a could be micro simulation, a, a useful tool. And I think also for policy evaluation, this uh, can be used. What I have to critically uh, criticize a little bit is that people doing micro simulations, they always present a very complicated model, modeling every single irrelevant decision people take. And very seldom I see actually that results are presented. So I would really encourage to, uh, to uh, use a little bit, maybe simpler models and use more time in, in actual analysis than in developing these models. A very nice way uh, or very innovative, I found uh, Robert's presentation because there's, you, there's two important direction of welfare state transfers. This is between income groups, which is always in the mind of people. They think of public transfers being between income groups, but we know most of these transfers are actually across age groups. I am also working on a paper where we want to analyze this a little bit and see if there is a conflict between uh, transfers across age groups and transfers across income groups. What I think is, doesn't exist yet is a framework that allows you to really uh, separate these two effects. I like the suggestions of Robert and his co-authors that using a, a regression model, but I think it is uh, still a little bit uh, too simple yet. I would uh, like to see this, this the, a little bit theoretical framework behind this model developed more. Yeah, this is all I say to, her, to, to this presentation. I like it. I like the direction NTA is going and to become really uh, get away from this age and really integrating demographic uh, developments or demographic analysis and economic analysis in this way. So thanks very much to all the presenters. Thank you very much, Bernhard, for your comments. And now I'd like to turn to our final uh, scheduled person, and that is Agnieszka. Yes, uh, I, I fully agree with Bernhard. It is a fascinating uh, session and very interesting um, results and pretty complementary, I must say, with all the presentations and I agree with a lot of what uh, Bernhard said about the directions of uh, the NTA research. Um, with the first paper run, I think um, it, there is a very interesting result comparing gender declining uh, inequalities by gender and incre increasing inequalities by education. I think that uh, it also in indicates that actually women are becoming more educated and because they are more educated that reduces the, the gender differences in a way. So the uh, composition of education uh, or the structure of education actually affects also gender differences. So it would be very interesting to look at gender and education at the same uh, time. Um, I think the, the results also sh very clearly show what is also done in uh, Robert's uh, paper, namely that age matters more uh, than income when we look at the differences and uh, when we look especially at transfers that are received. And uh, uh, another issue is with taxes. Uh, uh, as you have shown, the, 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 I mean, the inequalities in taxes increase, but the redistribution actually remains pretty flat. So uh, with all 
quintile groups, the transfers received are pretty similar. That means that still when we look at the redistribution, it is not the redistribution from the highest to the lowest quintile, but rather from the highest quintile to the middle quintiles and also to highest quintile. So the income redistribution is not, I mean, the, the transfer redistribution uh, is not uh, targeted a lot towards the people that have lowest incomes. And again, this is the same as, as Robert shown in his, um, in his paper. Um, I think uh, the, jumping to Robert, I will go back to Emma, Tanya and Joze. Uh, I think uh, it would be interesting to see if the similar uh, outcomes are when, uh, I mean, to extend this analysis beyond Europe. European welfare systems are very much focused on age distribution and consumption smoothing. And these results show it very, uh, very clearly. Uh, I think it's good to also look at what happens at different stages of life course or at different age groups, because for the youngest people, we actually see that uh, the distribution is pretty flat. That means that the transfers received by those from the highest cess and the lowest cess are pretty much similar. Then for the working age, this is the part when welfare really affects targets towards the poorest. And then the pension systems is perfectly consumption smoothing or almost perfectly consumption smoothing. So uh, that seems that it seems that the Bismarckian idea of, of how pension transfers should be organized is pretty much alive when we look at uh, these results. Um, with uh, Emma, Tanya and Joze, I, I think it would be very interesting to fiddle a little bit with the assumptions. You assume very constant 2010 profiles, which uh, as shown by, by Ron, for example, in, in his paper, are indeed changing quite significantly. Uh, with increased number of people with higher education, also the education premium is, is uh, being reduced. So it may affect the results, but still, I think the most important takeaway from uh, this paper is that uh, improvements in the educational structure, in the higher share of people with uh, higher education uh, will mitigate some of the consequences of uh, the population aging, but uh, they cannot fully compensate it. So we still see the reduction in the labor, total labor income. So, and this is pretty similar to an analysis that was done uh, some time ago by Martin Stonowski, also using the uh, YASA projections and uh, projecting human capital changes and the impact on human capital on, uh, on the economic growth. So I think this is pretty much uh, uh, the same. And um, with CEO's presentation, I think it is a very fascinating new world of uh, having micro simulation models that uh, uh, really allow to simulate differences in household composition, in educational structure, in the uh, impact of changing change, change fertility on the NCA profiles in the future. And we, I look very much forward to seeing the, the final results that will be definitely very interesting. Thank you, that is all for me. So thanks very much, Aniska. We've got about uh, 10 minutes for um, open open discussion. I don't know if uh, I see there's a lot of uh, chat going on in the chat room. Um, so I don't know if anyone would like to open the, the uh, verbal discussion. No one says something. So I, let me be just brief. I just say this is an observation. You know, it's good to see some male female decomposition from Ron's paper, because I wonder if the, some of the result in the previous session is due to compositional effect uh, of a different, you know, male versus a female, right? Because they have a very different labor income, uh, labor force participation, and their public transfers are quite different. Just observation, okay? Because we had this uh, previous session and there was no decomposition by gender. So that's the observation. And another one is observation to a uh, uh, road guard. Uh, well, I mean, Robert, so 
when uh, we do this, right? So, you know, to estimate which is more important variable, but actually the, the hardcore econometricians hate this because the reason is there are so many unobserved variables, right? Omitted variables, right? And uh, we say that regression is not causation, it's just correlation. So uh, if you have uh, some omitted variables which is correlated with these all variables, uh, then we, the, inter the, the result should be interpreted as caution. Any, anyway, I can send you some reference because uh, there are some, some development about this as well. But uh, you know, the, just the saying that the result should be interpreted as caution because uh, with the, the, you don't know how the, these variables are correlated with the omitted variables. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Sanyo. Any, any other comments? Um, I'm um, sorry, I just wanted to ask Emma, if I, am, if I saw it well, I, I saw that your results, you have completely over education in Italy, no? Because average, the average in labor income profile is higher than the low, the, the high education. I, I, I wonder why, and then in the projection, this, re, this reverses, and I, I also, I'm also curious about why this reverses. Um, yes, so these are uh, these were total income uh, projections. It wasn't per, per capita. Uh, so basically, you have a lot of people that have a secondary education and not as many with the tertiary education. So they 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 have a better um, better uh, income. And then in 2060, this changes. Thank you. If I could address just one question that came in through the chat. Um, so Bernard asked uh, why there wasn't more gradient in the inflows, the public sector inflows. And I think it, it's always possible that I got something wrong, but barring that, um, I think it's somewhat a, a trade-off that there are um, big transfers like uh, the earned income tax credit that are very much uh, going to poor kids. And that program has expanded a lot over the years. It's pretty much our biggest sort of welfare program now. Um, and that's kind of trading off with the fact that on average, higher SES groups are receiving more public education just because they're living in states that spend more on kids' education. I don't have really great uh, measures of the public education by SES, but I have some geographic variation, which in the US is actually a pretty big deal because we vary a lot um, depending on where you live, how much public education you get. So there's a little trade off in some different programs. In, in the US, our public pension system is um, really quite progressive so that uh, low income people get uh, pensions that are quite high relative to their earnings history and high income people get pensions that are quite low relative to their earnings history. So it's rather different than the European situation. And then the healthcare uh, is pretty much the same for everyone. Okay, would any of the any of the authors like to respond to any of the comments? So I was just gonna say how, how you know, what, what we don't see when you, when you do these, um, calculate the life cycle deficits by socioeconomic status, and we saw it in the presentation on Mexico in one of the earlier sessions, is that what, what seems to happen is that the, the lowest socioeconomic status in, in the results I've seen either has very, very um, small uh, surpluses at the, at, during the working ages or, or even no surpluses at all, and the higher socioeconomic status have these huge surpluses at working ages which suggests to me that the, 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 the high socioeconomic status people are generating, um, well, much of the savings in the economy, firstly, and secondly, are, are financing much of the transfers that are happening to the lower socioeconomic um, groups. Um, and so, so if, if that's true, then the, the, the composition of the population between the different socioeconomic statuses is, is, is absolutely critical. And I think we saw something in Argentina yesterday, perhaps, where, you know, the, the, the author mentioned that the, the, the poverty level in Argentina fluctuated from 45% to 
10% or something, but there was a huge fluctuation in poverty levels in Argentina. Um, and, you know, I wonder whether that has any um, implications for the generation of savings and the sustainability of the redistribution that seems to be inherent in, in our society. Yeah, I think that's right. That's the silver lining to aging. This is going to bring down the system. <laughs> Sorry, Tom, I didn't, I, I'm not sure I follow. I'm not sure I follow. <laughs> no, the, the silver lining, we were talking about this yesterday in the inequality session, that the silver lining to all this is that the population aging itself is going to bring about the downfall of these systems. And so you have to rebuild better. Right. That's what Paolo was saying about his, because I was so depressed yesterday when they gave us all the stories about Latin America and how yes. nothing was going to get better ever. And right. then Paolo mentioned that, oh, hey, no, wait a minute. Maybe this impending collapse from population aging, exerting all these pressures on yeah. the system is kind of good because we, we're going to see that we have to build the system better. We've got to build it better. Well, I just, I mean, if that's true, I hope we find a way to manage the, manage the transition from where we are to where we need to be in a, in a, in a, in a, a non-disruptive or at least little disruptive way as possible. That's why Gates is going to be pouring millions into the NTA accounts, the NTA well, project. I hope so. Help us find the solution. Absolutely. Okay, well, um, I think that was a really great session. We've, uh, we've reached time. Um, so thank you all for participating.